enjoy it. Mm. Uh, and you know are the students that are doing their 18 number. Mm. So about to watch it. Next wedding, 18. 8, 10. No, I'm asking how many are we expecting? 8. 8.
split. Welcome um, to this uh, class today and good morning. Um, I hope you are hearing me loud and clear. Um, I want you to, from the onset, uh, you subscribe to this YouTube channel and also so that any other time I start a lecture, you'll be prompted uh, to join. The other thing is, um, I've requested that you communicate through writing on the YouTube wall, and then you said, so that we can keep the conversation going. In a question, in a comment, uh, simply post it. Uh, I need to know that you are connected and you are hearing it clearly by writing on the wall so that I can be certain that we are together. Uh, we are five right now, five of uh, you are watching, are participating in this election. I expect eight of you. So, but nonetheless, we'll continue. Um, we have been covering so far the medical statistics, descriptive statistics and um, so far we have covered the three of them we started with the measures of central tendencies and the three of them the mean mode and median then we went into the measures of dispersion consisting of the four areas, we did the variance, the standard deviation, the range, and interquartile range. Then we've covered measures of distribution. Last time we talked about modality, the skewness, and kurtosis. And today we are going to discuss still part of descriptive statistics, which is measures of association. And at the measures of association, uh, there are three relationships that we consider the covariance, the correlation, and regression. And the three of them we refer to them as bivariate relationships. Um, you'll also agree that the first three you are dealing with only one set of data, one set of data, and trying to describe that one set of data in terms of how the data in the data set is, has that tendency to come together towards the mean, right? That is the tendency to come to the center. And Again, we also discussed the tendency of data in a data set to spread, and that is dispersion, to spread away from the center, from the mean. And then the measures of distribution was to do with, uh, in terms of the, the mode, the most commonly repeated data in a data set. Then we talked about the skewness. You remember the skewness is you might find that data within a data set, but then it has tails, tailing toward one side, can be the left tail or the right tail. Uh, and then, of course, we talked about kurtosis, the pickedness of the data, the pickedness, and it has correlation with what we refer to as a probability density function, PDF. So far, so good. Now, when you come to measures of, say, of association, we now start dealing with two sets of data. Two sets of data. And that's the reason we refer to it as bivariate relationship. Bi meaning two. Variate is how they vary. Two sets of data, they are varying in a manner that they have got a relationship. That is to say, for example, 
if you think about uh, the students like you are eight of you and each one of you is putting a certain number of hours in revising for an exam preparing for an exam fees are fees there are scores that you get in an exam so there are two variables the time you spend in revision revising for an exam vis a vis the scores that you get in that exam so those two are two data sets that are varying so the question is is there a relationship between the time that you spend revising and the scores that you get in an exam and is that how can you describe that relationship in terms of covariance, correlations, and regression? And when you talk about covariance, covariance in that case, covariance will talk about the direction of the relationship. That is, is it a positive direction, meaning the more the time spent revising is associated with higher scores that is a positive covariance positive direction or is it that the more time you spend revising for an exam you end up getting lower marks can it be that case and if that was the case then that's a negative uh, direction or is it that it doesn't matter the time that you spend revising. It doesn't show any relationship with the marks you get. And that is zero direction, no direction. And therefore, covariance is all to do with, it gives the sense of direction of the relationship. Now, when you start thinking about the next thing is correlation. If you get to know the direction of the relationship, let's say it is positive. The more time you spend in revising for an exam, the higher scores that you get. The question is, how strong is that relationship? How strong? Is it that the more hours you put, the more uh, scores you get, if it's a positive uh, direction relationship? And therefore, when you start thinking about the strength of a relationship, it is correlation. Correlation has got both direction and strength of a relationship. Both direction and strength. Therefore, you cannot talk about correlation without having first talked about covariance of a data. And most of the time you, 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 you learn that in most literature this issue of covariance is left out because once you start understanding how to work out correlation, you already have calculated the covariance. So therefore, you find most of the literature take little time discussing covariance, but it's important to get to know how to calculate covariance on its own and then how to use it to calculate correlation. The other measure of association in a bivariate relationship is regression. Regression is all to do with uh, prediction. Prediction. If you are to get to know that the number of hours you spend revising for an exam vis a -vis the scores that you get in that exam. Is it possible, therefore, to say if you study for three hours, you will get 60%. If you start for study for four hours, you will get 82%. Is it possible to predict the marks that you get based on the time that you have spent studying? And therefore, when you start talking about prediction, of an event that is to come, then you are going into regression analysis. And this is a topic that I will not go through today, but in the next 
series of lecture I talk about regression both what you call linear regression and multiple regression so today I'll simply talk about covariance and correlation now another important thing about measures of association the bivariate relationships the three of them we also refer to them as linear linear relationships by fitted relationship covariance correlation and regression only deals with a, a data that is relating in a linear manner and what this one means is this there are three outputs that you'd get. One is where you get a data. Uh, this is y-axis. This is x-axis. y-axis, x-axis, y-x. If, therefore, this is a score in an exam, hours spent, hours spent, or time spent, let me talk about time spent revising, and scores in an exam. You may find that the score and the time here, if you read less marks, you get less time spent. Another one will go down there, another one will go down there, another student there, another one here, there, there. If you find such kind of a data, you start seeing that the data has a direction that as the time spent revising increases also the score is increasing however it is not a straight line if you are to draw you only draw the line of best fit and they say probably the cut is across there and this is a linear relationship, although it's not perfect linear. In life, you don't really get perfect linear relationship, except in some few cases. For example, of a perfect linear relationship is, uh, think about um, the number of uh, uh, people who will buy tickets to go for a movie vis-a-vis -vis the, the total sales or the sales that are there. The devil means if a ticket is 10 bob and you get 50 people getting to the movie, then it's 50 times 10. If it's 100, it's 100 times 10. So there's a perfect linear relationship in that. But in real life situation, in, especially in medicine, you will not get a uh, perfect uh, line. You will get a data like this one. On the other hand, you get uh, a data that will look like this. If you start get a data where as you x increases, y decreases, this is an example of a negative uh, linear relationship. Then you get another data here. For example, like that, 
he realized it has got no direction. If you are to do a line that will account for most of the data, it will be probably through here, through the center here. And this has got no relationship. So, positive relationship. Negative relationship and no relationship. Of course, these are what we refer to as scatter diagrams. Scatter diagrams. This is how they look like. There are other Okay, up to there, this is what you call linear relationship. As x increases, y will increase. Or as x increases, y decreases. Yes, or there is no relationship. As x increases, y is, cannot say that the data is increasing or decreasing. It is scattered. And you can only say there is no relationship. Now, that is as far as linear relationships are concerned. Do we have data that can be a non-linear relationship? Yes, they are there. They are data that can give you a non-linear relationship. And that's what I'm going to uh, show you. So we have positive linear relationship, negative linear relationship, and no relationship. The three of them are like three roots. Then you have non-linear. If I have to put here non non-linear relationship. For example, x and y, and you get a data that looks like this. You draw the line of it. It will go like that. This is what you call curve linear. Curve. Curve linear relationships. I'll give you an example. If you are studying, for example, the use of uh, electricity, uh, during different times of seasons, or different times of a day, and you say that uh, in one day you experience a, an extreme cold, an ex extreme heat, so that x-axis is the time of the day and y-axis is a unit of electricity or the energy that you are going to use. And the morning it is very really cold. Later in the day it is very really hot. In the middle it is average, neither very hot, neither very cold. You realize that um, let me try to give you some another example an, that is medical. Let me not go that route. You get lost. Let me give you a medical, a medical a medical experience uh, still with 
still with revision on exam. I may still continue with revising on exam. Time spent revising and anxiety level. This is uh, this sounds like medical scenario, case scenario. Time spent revising for an exam vis a vis the anxiety that a student is going to experience. Now you realize that there are students who are very good such that they would not even spend a lot of time revising. And therefore, if you come across one like that, you have spent very little time revising because he or she is confident that he's going to perform well in the exam. And therefore, the the time spent, very little time spent revising, and then you realize that the anxiety level is low. You get another extreme on this side who has spent a lot of time revising, and because that student has spent a lot of time revising, there is a sense that he or she is well prepared, the sense within him or her that's well prepared, and therefore the anxiety level is down. Right, this one suffices so well and is convinced that he's going to do well in that exam, so the anxiety level is down. And this one is so good naturally that even without revising, he's also going to do well, and there the anxiety level is down. But now the concern is those that allow the middle here, they have not revised well, the time spent with fission is not adequate. And are neither very good student unless we have revised very well. So there is a lot of anxiety around here, a lot of anxiety of how they are going to perform in that exam. So you find that this is not a linear relationship. This is what you call curvilinear relationship. And when you are talking about measures of association by very relationship, it does not apply to this kind of relationship. It only applies to linear relationship, one direction. This is like two direction or even three. Positive, then no relationship here, then another negative relationship. We do not do by very relationship, calculate these uh, parameters in non-linear relationship, but in linear relationship only. So, that was more of an introduction. I, I intend to go into how we determine covariance and then we go to correlation. And again, uh, feel free to send in a uh, comment, any question on the wall. I'll have a look at it and then I'll respond. I've indicated the covariance, covariance, the, we use covariance to determine the direction, direction, determine the direction of our relationship. And this is how we determine the direction of our relationship. You have 
two sets of data that are foreign data. The time spent by student revising visa fees, the scores the student gets in that exam. Those are two data that are varying. Therefore, it's a bivariate data. So we are establishing a bivariate relationship. And this is how we determine the direction. You draw you draw a graph of y axis vis a vis x axis where x is time spent revising and this score in an exam then I want you to think about the marks here let's say from like 40% all the way to 80% and different students get different marks and therefore you establish the mean of the class let's say the mean of the class is about 60% 60% that's the mean. So the mean of the class being 60% is going to be x bar. Remember the sign for sample mean is x bar. Then that is the time spent. So the time spent is the time spent. X axis the time spent. They spent zero hour to eight hours. So the average is not necessarily four because uh, if you have got a class of eight like you, some will spend two hours, another two students spend four hours, another one will spend seven hours here. So the average may not necessarily be four, you may find that the average is like uh, three hours. And this is bar x. Three hours is bar x. The mean. The mean. Then the max here, you get the average of y, which is a max, is y bar. The sample mean of the max. You draw, you draw a line that is y mean and draw another line x x mean so you get four quadrants quadrant one quadrant two quadrant three quadrant four you have got four quadrants we are determining the direction this is how we do covariance direction of the, this relationship between two variables x and y now the formula for covariance the formula for covariance if you write as cof into bracket x y covariance is summation of x minus x bar multiplied by y minus minus y bar y bar we divide by n minus 1 if you remember what we've been what we've done before 
if you remember what we did in, uh, in uh, one set of our data, when you are calculating the variance, you start seeing the variance, where a data is falling from the mean of that data set. But in this case, there are two of them. Therefore, we multiply this variation of x times variation of y. We divide by n minus 1. That is how we calculate covariance for x, y. However, I am interested with the direction. The direction of uh, the data, how they are moving together, covariance, how they are moving together in terms of sign. Now, this is a formula, it therefore means for data that is, this is x-axis, this is the mean. For data that is below the mean, for x, for x below the mean, it therefore means that x will be smaller than the mean. And when x is smaller than the mean, it therefore means that the answer here is going to be a negative answer. All right? It therefore means, it, the next thing is this. Therefore, any other figure here will be, if x is smaller and you find that y the y is also smaller than the y mean. The y is below the y mean. Again, you will get a negative value here. Because y which is smaller than y bar, you will get a minus uh, figure. So that you get a minus times a minus, this quadrant you will get a positive. On the other hand, if you have the same y uh, x being below the x bar and you get a minus and the y is above y bar which is a positive then negative times positive negative times positive is a negative In the same manner, if you have in, in, in uh, quadrant 1, it therefore quadrant 1 means that the, the x, the x is bigger than the x bar and therefore is a positive value and the y is a larger number than y bar, it's also a positive value. And the result of a positive times a positive is a positive. It's a positive answer. In the same manner, you go to the fourth quadrant. Fourth quadrant, you find that in the fourth quadrant, the x is larger than the x bar and therefore the answer here is a positive answer. However, the y here are lower than the y bar. And therefore, if you subtract y bar from a y that is lower than y bar, the answer is a negative. So positive times negative is a negative answer in all this. And therefore, the direction of covariance will be like this. If you find therefore a line that is cutting between a positive or positive like that, then you realize that it's going to be a positive direction. And if you find a line that is moving from a negative to a negative, then it's going to be a negative direction. And if it is flat, like this one, it's going to be a zero. A zero direction, no direction. 
That constitutes covariance. You can easily get to know the direction by simply plotting a scatter diagram and get to know the average of x and the average of y and see where there is so many data points in a scatter diagram and that will get you to know the direction now of the relationship between two variables. If you are to apply this formula therefore, you realize that, and I'll show you in the next uh, example, the answer you get here will be either a positive number or a negative number. And the positive will always is a positive direction and the negative is a negative direction. And the size of the number here, the size, whether it's going to be one positive one or a positive a thousand, it doesn't tell you anything else except the direction. Because the size, whether it's going to be a smaller number or a big number, depends on the scale, the size of the scale. It does not say anything else except the direction. That's all to do with covariance. This covariance, therefore, will only give you the direction, but not the strength of the relationship. All right. Um, can see quite a number of now. The room boy is there. Rajot, Vivian, Sarah. We need to call you uh, other brother to be with us. So allow me to go to correlation because that is where uh, I think I'll spend most of my time. So important to understand the correlation and also calculating some uh, determinants of the strength of the relationship. Hope this is understood. need to erase it. Uh, this uh, YouTube uh, video is going to be recorded for your reference. So even if you don't uh, complete writing, you get it as a recorded video. Talk about coordination. Or I have said that coordination, uh, when you do coordination, we want to establish both direction and strength of our relationship. This relationship, remember, is it of a linear relationship. Of a linear relationship. The strength of a linear relationship. For me to take it, take you through and, and explain in a manner that you are able to to grasp it properly, I will still use an example of uh, uh, the scores the student will get 
in an exam vis a vis the time spent uh, revising for that exam. And uh, therefore, uh, start with like uh, a hypothesis. Though I've not taken you through hypothesis, but I assume quite a number of you have uh, uh, come across the issues of hypothesis. Uh, allow me to do a narrow hypoth hypothesis. The narrow hypothesis is for, in this case, the narrow hypothesis will be like the number of hours the student studies for an exam the number of hours the student spent revising for the final exam is positively no now is not is not positively correlated with the score in the exam. That's the narrow hypothesis, hypothesis of no effect. Hypothesis of no effect, narrow hypothesis, HO, is that the number of hours the student spent revising for the final exam is not positively correlated with the score in the exam. And therefore means the alternate hypothesis would be the opposite of this one. The alternate hypothesis would be that the number of hours the student spent devising for the exam is positively correlated with the score in the exam at the alternate. But of course, as you have learned, is that we can only test a narrow hypothesis. So I want to use this statement to take you through correlation and interpreting the resource of the data that you get plus giving it a meaning giving it a meaning and the other question would be is it would there be a possibility then that if you were to know the number that one has spent devising for that exam we can predict the marks or the score and that is now part of regression I'll touch on it slightly, but I'll take time using this example to demonstrate both direction and strength, and more so the strength and how to calculate the strength of that relationship. All right. I want to give a data. Of concern, you can still write it and look at it. You can now say continue or continue, right? So, up there, you have our NAR hypothesis. I'll put 
student student there let me save, save up here we are still on correlation still on correlation uh, we have student Hours studied, hours studied, hours for revision, hours revised, or time spent revising in terms of hours. That would be better. Time spent revising. Time spent revising in terms of hours the score the score in an exam so time spent revising I'll call it our X to be in X axis and the scores to be our Y Student number one, let me use student number A, you are eight, I put, I can see now I'm seven. Student R, P, uh, Y, let me spread properly. This is who? Vivian. Hmm? Rajot. Uh, who is it? Who is there? Edna. Sarah. One, two, three, four. Diani. One, two, three, four, five. Yvonne, one, two, three, four, five, six, and Ruth, and don't take it personal if you get uh, fewer marks, it's just for demonstration purposes, for demonstration purposes. Spent two hours. P spent four hours. Spent five hours. Seven. Three. One hour. Six hours. Time spent. These are terms of hours. Then when the scores are out, guess 58. The other one get 32, God forbid. 63, 87 is percent. 67 percent. 45 percent. And 68 percent. And 68 percent. The question is, forget about even the name for the, the student. The question is this: Can you confidently say that there is 
a relationship between the time spent revising for the exam, vis a vis the score, the marks that each one of the student get. And is it a positive direction? Is it a negative? Positive meaning the more hours that you spend, the more marks that you get. Or negative direction, the more hours you spend, the lesser marks you get. And what is the strength of that relationship? When you start talking about the strength, calculating the strength of the relationship, that's coordination. And I will show you how you calculate that strength of a relationship. The next thing will be our touch on regression, where can you therefore predict the mark the student will get by just looking at the hours spent revising. Now, the formula is like this. Uh, if you can remember the formula for covariance, when we start now calculating the strength of the relationship, we talk about what you call Pearson's Pearson's correlation coefficient, which we also denote as R. Pearson's correlation coefficient denoted as small R. And Pearson Correlation coefficient R is given by square root of summation of x minus x bar squared multiplied by summation of x minus uh, y sorry this y y minus y bar squared. If you can remember, this look like variation in a single set of data and this is standard deviation in a single uh, set of data. Therefore, when you are doing Pearson collision coefficient, this is basically variation defined by standard deviation. Variation of x and y is covariance. Covariance divided by standard deviation of each one of them. Basically, that's how it is. I need to know whether you you are back. I can tell that you are off. When you are back, please let me know so that I continue. Ah, now it's back. Very well. So, I write the same equation down here so that I uh, free a space, that space. Pearson uh, 
Uh, I want to push everything up so that allow me to, to squeeze it so that I have a space. I had I had V. I forgot it, but don't worry. V P. V P E S S Y Y. Oh, sorry. After after S is M. M. Then Y. Then P. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Very well. I want to squeeze four thirty two. Five six degree. Seven into seven. Three six or seven. One forty five. Six six eight. So that I free space down here. Now, um, so that I do Pearson. Called Pearson correlation coefficient, which is denoted R. And R, we said we calculate by doing a summation of x minus x bar uh, y minus y bar divided by square root of square root of summation of x minus x bar squared multiplied by summation of y minus y bar squared. Alright, uh, from Edna. You're asking me to, to repeat on this. Uh, I've said this, that when you want to, to determine the strength of the relationship between two variables, like time spent revising in terms of hours, we call it x, as a data, x designated or denoted x, then Further, the score, which is percentage score, which you designate y in y axis, then you want to establish is there, is there a relationship, and if there is, what is the strength of this relationship? In that case, we apply what we call Pearson's. Correlation coefficient, Pearson's correlation coefficient. You'll find other uh, measures of the strength, like Spearman's rank order correlation. However, the one that is most used in uh, science is Pearson's correlation coefficient, and that's what I would deal with for now as I demonstrate how we determine the strength of that relationship and how to interpret that strength. Therefore, this is already established by this gentleman who came up with this line of thinking. He's called Mr. Pearson, and therefore he named it after his own name. Pearson co Correlation Coefficient, R. And you determine R by doing a summation of X minus X bar, where X bar is the mean, multiplied by Y 
minus y bar, the summation of that, I'm going to take you through, divide by the square root of x minus x bar squared, y minus y bar squared. And I said, if you look at this, it's like we are determining the failures. And when you look at this, it's standard deviation. And when you have the two x and y, it's the covariance of x and y, divided by the standard deviation of x, multiplied by the standard deviation of y. And that is the reason why in some, in some literatures, you will find R written as covariance of x and y, defined by standard deviation of x multiplied by standard deviation of y. So don't get lost when you see this. It just simply means it's the same as this. This is a covariance of x, y, divided by standard deviation of x multiplied by standard deviation of y. I know you're asking, where is n minus 1? Remember here there was n minus 1 and here is n minus 1. So n minus 1 cancels n minus 1 and you remain with this. So when you see this formula, it's the same as this. And for you to calculate this, it's easier to explain it using this one because you have x and y's. All right. Vivian Jerry is saying the last one was capital R. I have not talked about capital R anywhere. It's a letter. Oh, it's here. All right. Good. Let me erase. This is the same as this. I want to erase here. I create space for calculations. As we go along, I will be reading your, your post. Uh, I think Edina, you had asked about, uh, I repeat how to derive Pearson collision coefficient. You had gone off. I've done that. Yes, you are back. Sarah Kate, Vivian. The last one was R. I have sorted it out. We can continue. I have like uh, uh, 40 more minutes. I'll have, I'll have finished in good time, don't worry. Therefore, what we do is, number one, we calculate the mean, the mean, which is x bar. How do we calculate x bar? We add 2 plus 4 plus 6 uh, plus 5 plus 7 plus 3 plus 1 plus 6. When you calculate that, when you divide by the number, how many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 2 plus 4 is 6, 11, 18, 21, 22, 28. 28 divided by 7, the answer is 4. That's it. So x bar is equal to 4 because n here is 7 and n here is 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Then you add 2 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 plus 6. That is 28 divided by 7. The answer is 4. x bar is 4. In the same manner, you calculate y bar, which is you add all these together and you divide by 7. I have done it for you. When you add all of them and you divide by 7, the answer you get is 60. I have done for you for the sake of time. But you know how to calculate the mean. I have calculated the mean of y and the mean of x. Let me, let me put it nicely. x bar is equal to 4, y bar is equal to 60. Good, we are moving on well. The next will be x to do x minus x bar, y 
minus y bar. When you say x minus x bar, you come 2 for x divided by uh, 2 minus 4. It is x minus x bar. 2 minus 4 is minus 2. 4 minus 4 is 0. 5 minus 4 is 1. And we move on like that. So we have minus 2, 0, 1. We can continue. 7 minus 4 is 3. 3 minus 4 is minus 1. 1 minus 4 is minus 3. 6 minus 4 is 2. Is it? So we have 2 minus 3 minus 1. 3, 1, 0, minus 2. That's correct. In the same manner, you calculate, you determine y minus y bar. This y bar is 60 and this is y. So, y58 minus 60 is minus 2. That 2 minus 60 is minus 28. Then, uh, 63 minus 60 is 3. Then 87 minus 60 is 27. 67 minus 60 is 7. 45 minus 60 is minus 15. 68 minus 60 is 8. And we have completed that. The next thing is to do But according to this, we want to multiply summation of x minus x bar and y minus y bar, the summation. So, you come and do the other x minus x bar you multiply by y minus y bar. So, x minus x bar multiplied by y minus y bar. This time this is 4. 0 times negative 28 is 0. Anything multiplied by 0 is 0. 1 times 3 is 3. 3 times 27. I need your help there. 3 times 27 is 8 to 1. Minus 1 times 7 is minus 7. Minus 3 times minus 15 is 45, positive 45. 2 times 8 is 16. When you do that, then you find a summation. A summation of x minus x bar multiply by y minus y bar and that is the summation that you are looking for here so you add them when you add them and you you add 4 plus 0 plus 3 7 plus this minus this you add them I think the answer you get not I think I know I've done it's 142 you can you can verify that is 142. The answer is 142. So we have gotten this. So the next is to get this and this. How do you go about it? You do x minus x bar squared. You get to know how and we have x minus x bar is this one. This one you square them. Minus 2 times minus 2 is 4. 0 times, 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, minus 1 times minus 1 is 1, minus 3 times minus 3 is 9, minus uh, 2 times 2 is 4. See whether you get that. 4, 0, 1, 9, 1, 9, 4. And you sum it. Because it's summation. 
when you sum it x minus x bar squared the answer you get there is you add them this will be 28 you do the same for y y minus y bar squared so y minus y bar is this y minus y bar you square this line so minus 2 times minus 2 is positive 4 minus 28 times minus 28 is 784 minus 3 times minus 3 is 9 27 times 27 is 729. I have done calculation before. 7 times 7 is 49. Minus 15 times minus 15 is 225. 8 times 8 is 64. Then you do summation of y minus y bar squared. And the answer is going to be... 1864 if you sum all this is 1864 any queries over I want to know that we are together so up to there how we have derived all this and I um, I also want to say this, that most of the time as science researchers, medical researchers, you will probably be using uh, software like GraphPad, alright, GraphPad Prism. So you will just enter the data and request that it generates the Pearson collision coefficient. However, at this point in time, it's important to know how it is calculated so that when you start seeing it, you know the background. And also now how to interpret the R when we get it. Right? So the reason we are going through all this pain of deriving the R, because it's a standard way. Alright. Are you together? We are together. Vivian, you are saying we are together. Ruth, you are following. I want to hear the others. Good. Very good. Rajot, the lecture is going on well. So now we will come and insert these values in this equation. And when we insert it, we will say this. R therefore is summation of x minus x bar is what? x minus x bar. Summation of x minus x bar is 142. Summation of x minus x bar multiplied by y minus y bar x minus x multiplied by this, this summation is here, is 142. You divide this with summation of x minus x bar squared, this one, square root of multiplied by, or simply put, let me avoid that and say multiplied by square root of 1864. We we'll work it out to be 142. If you work this out, so you go to go to 22.46. And therefore the, our R is equal to what? Our R is equal to 0 0.62. Very good. 
good. We have gotten our we have gotten our R Pearson correlation coefficient. Let me give you time, a minute to There is a conceal, Sarah Kate, Medic Limited. Who is Medic Limited? Edna Karugo Project, Vivian Ruth. Are we to get up there so that then I go into interpreting this? Joy Jerry, are you together? Dick, check your calculation. I also confirm 142. Square root of twenty eight. Five point two nine. Hmm? Yes, let me check. Let me check my dick. Square root of 28 is 5.29. Five five square root of 18 is 64. 43.17. mistake was here the square root the square root of 28 is actually 
5.29 the square root of 1864 is 43.17 so 5.29 multiplied by 43.17 the answer is not 22 sorry for that the answer here is what uh, is 228.36 all right then you define 142 by this the answer is 0 0.62156 all right to two decimal places therefore is 0 0.62 i hope medic limit medic limit it we are together I need to know whether we are together up there now. Thank you for that collection. All right. See, Dennis 0 0.62156. That is according to Dennis. Joy Jane 0 0.62. Correct. Right. Okay. Medic IQ is Yvonne. Yvonne, you are together? Yeah, it's on there. That's correct. So we proceed. Are we together? Are we, is that okay? We move on. As you look at that, uh, allow me for a minute, I uh, come back, one minute. Presentation is frozen on my head. It has turned out. Thank you. 
All right. Back to session. Please text when it restarts. Same. Well, just wait. We will just wait. Enjoy. Successfully connected. The new link. No, no. no it's a Right, if you can hear me. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I'm told we are back uh, to session. Uh, let me know when uh, when you are okay on your side. Let us know you are streaming. Uh, kids, yes, you think I can hear you. Who else can hear me? Who else can hear me? The robot is still frozen. Podcast or podcast? Ah, uh, Sarah Kate, your thing is good on your side. Oh, 
Rubo, I need you to join us. Let me know. All right. Ah, Joy Jerry, you're saying you are okay on your side. Sarah Kate is okay. Okay. Let's um, move on. Sorry for the for that. It's taking a cohich. Uh, of course, technology at times errors. But um, Lukasha, I need like uh, around 20, 25, 30 minutes more to finish up with this. Um, I need to know whether it's okay, whether you have another class. I don't know. Um, um, of course, you appreciate that I could not have. It could not have been an effective way of taking you through this uh, kind of uh, uh, workouts on uh, Google Meets or Zoom. And, and uh, the reason I thought is we are going to do it more so in statistics. I want to. Karugo, you see, is okay. Now let's just move on. At the moment, yes, I need to know whether it's okay. I've asked uh, Yvonne to confirm in the class. Um, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Very good. We have done the bulk uh, of the work. We've been able to compute the Pearson's correlation coefficient. And we have our R being C. Now, the Pearson correlation coefficient from this is 0 0.62. The next question is, what does it mean? And, and, and um, I want to erase this so that now we discuss the R being 0 0.62 in relationship, remember, to our narrow hypothesis. Remember, our narrow hypothesis was that the number of hours that a student paid in uh, revising does not positively uh, is not positively correlated or related generally to the scores so what's the is issue with r what do we learn from r what is the interpretation Facts about correlation. Uh, so far, you know, uh, when we do correlation, we are interested in the direction of uh, variation when you vary um, the set of data A, how the set de data set B varies. When you vary X axis data, how does Y axis data file uh, and the strength of relationship is determined by R, the person's coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient. Now, uh, it is of interest number one to know that the person's coefficient. Correlation coefficient Correlation coefficient R ranges 
minus 1 2 plus 1 all the time all the time the correlation coefficient that r will range from minus 1 to plus 1 of course with 0 at the center if you get an r of 0 it therefore mean that there is no relationship between set of data a variable a and a variable b x and y there is no correlation at 0 if r was to be 0 if r is positive 1 it means there is a strong correlation positive correlation strong positive correlation when r is negative 1 there is a strong negative correlation a strong negative correlation a strong positive correlation and here there is no relationship that's what it means now our r is 0 0.6 positive 0 0.62 that's our r what does it mean there is a moderately a moderate relationship well, let me simply say there is a strong relationship because anything that is below 0 0.5 is is weak relationship to 0. Point, uh, sorry it's not 0 0.5 it's 0. Point, 0 0.1 0 0.5 is moderate and moving this way is strong. Weak relationship, moderate relationship, strong relationship. So in our case, it's a strong relationship between the number of hours spent revising vis-a-vis -vis the scores. If you are to calculate an R, and you find it is more than minus 1, this is minus 1 point something, 1 point 1, 1 point 2 is a negative 2. Or if you find it is more than positive 1, is 1 point 1, or it is 2 or 3, then there is a problem in your calculation. Because R always will be between minus 1 and plus 1. Plus is a positive direction, positive correlation. Minus is a negative correlation negative direction so that thing that is understood I hope that's understood now another important thing is this therefore quiz if you have a relationship of uh, 0 0.1 R being 0 0.12, another one is negative 0 0.68, another one is 0 0.50, another one is 0 0.02. Which one shows relationship that is stronger, the strongest relationship? That's a piece I need to see your answer. Just post it. You have is a quiz, an R of 0 0.12, an R of negative 0 0.68, 0 0.50, 0 0.02. Which among this one has got the strongest relationship? I need your answers. Post it there. One. Uh -huh. According to 
Adina is 0 0.68, negative 0 0.6 is uh, Dennis is uh, 0 0.50, the others. Med Q phone is this. I'm asking this among these relationships whose are the Pearson collision coefficient is 0 0.12, another one is negative 0 0.68, another one is 0 0.50, another one is 0 0.02. Which among these indicates a relationship that has got strongest relationship? Which are in the case strongest relationship in this? So we have diverse uh, answers. Saraket is this. Joy Jerry, the same. Yvonne, 0 0.5. Dennis, 0 0.5. Do you want to change your answer? Yuri and Jerry. 0 0.68 Dennis and Medic do you want to change your answer? I'm not asking whether it's positive or negative negatively correlated I'm only asking about the strength the strength of the relationship I'm not asking about the direction I'm asking about the strength Dennis I say sorry, six point zero eight. My dick. I'm not talk, asking about the direction because it's positive. This is negative direction, positive, positive. I'm asking about the strength. The the. As the R tends towards positive 1, positive 1 would be the, a perfect, perfect positive correlation. Negative 1 would be perfect negative correlation. So the strength from 0 towards positive 1 or from 0 towards negative 1. So the higher the absolute value the higher the relationship i can tell now all of us here all of you we have the same plane the higher the value towards positive one the better the stronger the relationship positive one is this perfect relationship positively correlated negative one is a perfect relationship negatively correlated but i say in life you may not get strictly especially these uh, perfect relationships but you get a value between 0 and uh, positive 1. So our 0, 0 0.62 is a strong relationship between time spent, hours spent revising and the scores at 0 0.62. Now, the other question that we'll ask ourselves, we have established that there is a, a positive correlation between hours spent revising Correlation coefficient is 0 0.62. Our R is 0 0.62. The next question would be, is this a statistically significant? Do we have confidence that we can use it to predict the marks that a student will get if we only knew one variable, and that is the time spent in hours revising? Now, when we move from now there towards predicting, we are moving towards linear regression. And the first question will be, how confident are we that we can predict? And that issue of how confident are we constitutes what you call p-values, probability values. I am sure that we have not... I've not taken you through that, but I'm going to go over it so that when the time comes that we start studying, uh, doing the probability distribution, you appreciate where you're coming 
or with the intention of uh, that lecture. Now, if the question is, we now know there is a strong relationship, but how sure are we that we can use it to predict? We can only do that when we understand what is called statistical significance or test. And we need, first of all, to establish how confident am I that I can predict with this data. And that confidence, you must have heard about the levels of confidence. In science, we accept the level of confidence anything that is 95% and above. 95% and above. If I'm 95% confident that I can use this data, then I'll take it as a gospel truth. So it's never 100%, 95%. And 95%, therefore, I'm leaving a room for an error that it can be out of something else, random chance, but not this one, with 5%. 5% chance, 5% 5 chance, 500, which is 0 0.05, that's the probability chance that is out of error and not the claim I had given from the uh, beginning. And 5 Chance, that is what we give. Anything that is less or equal to 5% is acceptable and is statistically significant. And therefore, if I am able to calculate the p value of less or equal to 0 0.05, that means the confidence level I have that what I'm saying is true is 95%. I'm 95% confident that I can predict the mark that you get based on the time that you have spent revising. I'm 95% confident that I can predict it accurately. It therefore means I have a probability of an error that I can incur there and of 5%, which is P of 0 0.05. To get up there. Good. I'll take you through this. Probably I'll touch, I'll move around it now after, not even after. I think I should go into it now. I'm a bit hesitant because I know it might be new to you. But uh, allow me to move on it to, to take you through it. Don't worry. Are we together up to there? Okay. Note that one first. Remember our, let me have you back. Remember our narrow hypothesis. Our narrow hypothesis was that the number of hours spent revising for the final exam. is not positively related to the scores in that exam. That was our narrow hypothesis, which is zero. The hypothesis of no effect. And when we are testing the hypothesis, we test the hypothesis that is narrow hypothesis. And if at the end of it we can only reject narrow hypothesis or we accept narrow hypothesis, we are going to either reject 
null hypothesis if the calculated R, the one you have calculated, 0 0.62, our calculated R is less than the critical R. I'll, I'll tell you what the critical R. When our calculated R Pearson correlation coefficient, which we calculated 6.2, is less than the critical R. I'll tell you where we get critical R. If it is less, then what we do here, we reject. narrow hypothesis hypothesis we reject narrow hypothesis let me put it nicely reject narrow therefore mean therefore that if calculated r which is 0 0.62 is greater or equal here is only rest if it's rest here is greater or equal because at the point of critical it must be taken as this one is critical critical r then I know most of the literatures will say accept, accept narrow hypothesis, but the proper, the proper science is that you fail to reject you fail to reject narrow hypothesis. When you say you fail to reject narrow hypothesis, in essence, you are trying to say accept narrow hypothesis. However, in science, we do not accept narrow hypothesis. We fail to reject narrow hypothesis. I'll explain that in depth, what it means. But for now, just know uh, when to reject narrow hypothesis and when to fail to reject or when to accept narrow hypothesis. You see, if the narrow hypothesis was that the number of hours spent revising for the final exam is not correlated, is not positively related to the score. If we reject it, if we reject it, then what you are saying is that if we reject the narrow hypothesis, then we are saying that it is, we remove not, and we say is it is correlated. When we reject the hypothesis, then we can only accept the alternate. And the alternate would be, you remove not, and it will say, the number of hours spent revising for the final exam is positively related to the score in exam. And the question is, where do we get our critical R? Where do we get our critical R? Our critical R Adina Karuba, you are saying you just come back. Uh, what did we miss? And uh, all right, all right. Allow me to write it down here. With blue color. I'm saying this. Forget about this for a minute so that I bring this issue of uh, p values and uh, uh, confidence level and all that. 
Yeah, I'm saying that we have seen that our R calculated R was 0 0.62 and the interpretation is this. The correlation coefficient of 0 0.62 in the case there is a positive linear relationship between hours spent revising and the scores in that exam. There is a positive linear relationship. There is a positive correlation. So far so good and you saw the strength is 0 0.62 and I say it can be from negative 1 all the way to positive 1 through 0. 0 is no relationship. Positive uh, 1 is the perfect relationship. So you say anything 0 to about uh, to about 0 0.1 there about you move from weak relationship, moderate relationship about 0 0.5 and above there to 1 is a strong relationship. So ours is a strong relationship. We have established that. And we are finished with correlation. Correlation, we are seeing the direction is positive and the strength is strong relationship of coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient of 6, 0 0.62. So we established that. But I decided to go a step further into a bit of regression. And regression was that, is it possible therefore to use the data that we have here to predict what you will get, the mark the student will get, but if you only knew that he, he has spent so this number of hours devising, are we able to predict that? And when you go to predicting, we are going into the areas of regression. But I have said, I'm going to cover it in depth in the next lecture. However, this is important to understand. If we are going to predict anything, we must be confident that the data that we have here is not out of random chance. It's because there is a relationship between Y and X or X and Y. Therefore, in science, we will agree to use that information as truth if we are at least 95% confident that there is cause and effect. There is cause and effect. When you study this, you get that now, uh, uh, those marks. When you put two hours, you get 50%. When you put three hours, you get 60%. When you put, you put in five hours, you get 80%. So there is cause and effect. That's what we want to establish. And that is normally in the regression. Regression. However, at the level of correlation, we always say that correlation is not causation. Correlation is not causation. There is no establishment of causation at the level of correlation. Correlation only will tell you there is a relationship between variable A and variable B and the strength of relationship. But it is not supposed to tell you that A is causing B to behave like this. When you go to that level, you are going to regression. Therefore, I'm taking you slightly ahead by after calculating this, are we able to predict to get into the linear regression? But before we get there then, we had our now hypothesis that we had stated from the word go that you are testing whether we are going to reject our now hypothesis or whether we are going to accept the now hypothesis. And I've just said in science we do not simply accept the narrow hypothesis but we do what we call we, re we fail to reject. We fail to reject. That's a proper science. We fail to reject. And when we fail to reject narrow hypothesis, in essence, we are saying we are accepting the alternate hypothesis. 
Null hypothesis was a hypothesis of no effect, that the number of hours spent revising the exam is not positively related with the score. That's null. And now we want to determine, do we accept it, do we reject it, or fail to reject? In essence, do we take in the alternate hypothesis? How do we do that? We say calculated R, which is 0 0.62, if it is less than the critical R, then we reject null hypothesis. And if we reject it, then we, it means we accept the alternate hypothesis. So, if the calculated R therefore is, uh, is greater or equal to critical R, then that's the time to accept the null hypothesis or fail to reject. That's the term we use. And I'll see this then. Where do we get critical R from? How do we determine critical R? It's calculated, but where is critical R coming from? In all statistic, statistical books, in all statistical books, you'll find what you call statistical tables at the back of those books. Statistical tables. You'll find statistical table for correlation work. You'll find for student details. You'll find one for analysis of variance. All that. Since I didn't have it here with me, I'll take the liberty of just explaining and then give you work to go and uh, have a look at the statistical table, probability distribution table for correlation. When you go and look for it in the books, at the back of the book there are those probability distribution tables, you'll find the one for correlation. And for the one for correlation, what you do, at the top, you'll find what we call uh, the degree of freedom. The degrees of freedom. All right? The degrees of freedom, in this case, will be what? We had n is equal to 7 for, for x, and n was 7 for y. So the number of data was n for x, which is 7, plus n for y, which was 7, was 14. All right? 14. But the degree of freedom in this case is not minus 1, you minus 2, because you have two sets of data for the x and for the y. So the degree of freedom will be 14 minus 2. And this table that you see there, you'll see the degree of freedom. And it will be two. There is one tail and there are two tail. When you look at one tail, how do you differentiate it from two tail? One tail is where the hypothesis predict a direction. Like this hypothesis already predict a positive direction. And therefore it becomes a one tail. Two tail test is where the hypothesis stated does not indicate direction. If there was no word positive here, it will be that it is related to the score. If there was no positive, it will be a two tail. Because it will mean it can go either way. All right? Remember, the degree of freedom in this case is 14. So the table will have 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way, you see quite a number. If you write 14, that's the degree of freedom. Then down here is a p-value. Where do we get p-value from? p-value is probability that the result you are getting, you have 95% confidence. And therefore, the probability that's out of a random chance or error is only 5%. And I've said 5% is 5 over 100 is 0 0.05. At 95% confidence, I'll accept 
or reject the null hypothesis. So you'll see 0 0.1, 0 point, let's say, you see 1, 1.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.0, 0 0.10, 0 .10, that way. So you come to 0 0.05 because you have already set your p value to be less than 0 0.05. That's when you set yourself at the beginning of setting the null hypothesis that you accept or reject null hypothesis at p value of 0 0.05, which is a confidence level that 95% confident that I can rely on this data. So you go at the p value, then you draw a line and 14 degree of freedom, where they intersect here, you find critical value written there. That's the critical value. There. This one, don't, 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 don't get stressed so much about it. You repeat again and again when you come to establishing critical value here, based on p-value and degree of freedom, whether it's one tail or two tail test. In this case, I had worked out, I had checked, and the critical value, given the degree of freedom, and this one tail test, and the p-value of 0 0.05, I had worked out the, the critical value, and the critical value was 0 0.47, or 0 0.457. 0 that one I've checked from the tables. Degree of freedom 14 in a one tail test, and p value was 0 0.05. The critical value was 0 0.457. All right. So the question was this: If I put another 0 0.45. There. Which one is correct? If you compare 0 0.62 and 0 0.45, which one is greater than that? Is it correct that calculated the 0 0.65 and therefore is less? No, of course it's not less. 0 0.62 is greater than this. Is correct. Therefore, this shows that our calculated 0 0.62 is less is greater rather than 0 0.45 and therefore we accept null hypothesis we fail to reject null hypothesis what that one means is this I mean, see what you are saying? I want to see your comment so far.
Zero, zero, zero. Okay. I can see there is an issue with uh, understanding this. Now you're saying explain probability of error. I had gone off on my side, I missed something. That means, can you explain what you meant by degree of freedom? Relation between correlation R and P value and critical is not clear. All right, all right. Let me explain again. Interpretation of R. Uh, remember, uh, allow me to repeat uh, slowly, deliberately. I'm going to be slow, deliberately, so that we move on together. Deliberately, I'm going to be slow. I have 20 minutes on my side. Uh, I should be finishing the next uh, like 15 minutes. I want to believe by uh, you, you can comfortably calculate R, Pearson correlation coefficient. Let me know whether you are comfortable calculating R by a show of hard there. That's in yes. Are you comfortable in calculating R? R being Pearson correlation coefficient. We start there. Before I bring the issue of BF, degree of freedoms, probability, error, and all that. If you enjoy it, you are saying you are okay up to calculating R. And R is correlation coefficient. Now remember what I've said R uh, always is between negative 1 to positive 1. Negative 1 indicating perfect negative linear correlation and positive 1 indicating pos uh, ideal or perfect positive linear correlation. 0 indicating no relationship. If you get up there, I'm, I'm happy. If you get up there, uh, I appreciate because the next is now interpretation of what does that R mean? What does it mean that R? What does it mean? Well, um, what I do because of uh, constraints of time, constraints of time. I've noted that if I go on talking about uh, confidence level, I talk about probability value. Um, it's so new to you probably, you have not covered it. I'll, I'll, I'll look for time and take preliminaries. If really you don't understand what you call degree of freedom, then I'll have to start from afar. I'll start from a far distance. So. 
That is, you are saying that if we say that the number of hours spent in vision is not positively correlated to the max, that because we are failing to reject the narrow hypothesis, but it was such a strong correlation. Just, just wait a minute, Dennis. Just wait a minute. I'll take you through that. Now, um, let me digress slightly. Probably I'll come back to this uh, area later. I've said R is supposed to be within negative 1 or the right positive 1. At the center, no relation should be 0. And that is R. So R uh, shows the strength of the relationship, the bivariate relationship. R shows the strength of bivariate relationship. And that is what we call Pearson's R. And all this is do with correlation. So 0 0.62 is a strong, it's a strong relationship. I will introduce another term here. Pearson's R squared. What I have done is to uh, I've decided to hold on the issue of uh, confidence level and probability values for now because I'm thinking there's a lesson that I need to give you before we interpret that extent. But I need to talk about Pearson's R squared, what is called R squared. Pearson's R squared, which is called R squared, which is R squared is simply R times R, which was 0 0.62 times 0 0.62. What's the answer? Zero point six two times zero point six two. The answer is uh, R squared is equal to zero point three eight four four. Call it zero point three eight. Our R squared. So, um, I will discuss the issue of degree of freedom in a separate lecture. So we'll hold on uh, going the issue of uh, hypothesis testing, whether to accept or reject when we get there. Let me go through all that. So I want us to talk briefly about Pearson's R square, R square, which is basically R times R, 0 0.62 times 0 0.62. And you see it's 0 0.38. This Pearson's R squared is what we refer to as correlation coefficient of determination coefficient of determination is the same. It's also called coefficient determination, R squared. Now you will see this, that even if, even if our R was a negative value here, 
and you multiply it by itself, it will become a positive value. So, R squared is always a positive value. And that rule of the thumb, rule of thumb is that R is anywhere between 0 and 1. R squared, sorry. R squared will always be anywhere between 0 and 1. Because the as you can get is 1 here. 1 times 1 is 1. And therefore, this is no relationship and this is perfect. No relationship is perfect relationship. This is coefficient of determination and you get it from squaring the Pearson's R, the coefficient of correlation. So coefficient of collision squared becomes coefficient of determination. What is the importance of R squared? Allow me to proceed with this. Pearson R squared, also called coefficient coefficient of determination. R squared. Pearson's R squared gives R squared. Coefficient of determination. What is it determining? What is it determining? What is it determining? Pearson, ah, okay, R, Pearson coefficient applies in correlation, R squared applies in regression. Pearson R is coefficient. Uh, correlation coefficient coefficient of determination coefficient Correlation coefficient applies in correlation. Coefficient of determination applies in regression. I don't want. I want you to get that one from what go. This is zero point six two. This is zero point three eight.
what is the meaning, what is the application, what is the interpreti interpretation R squared. What is the question? What does it mean? R squared we got is 0 0.38 which is the same as that 8 percent number of hours spent in revision versus course in the exam. Number of hours is independent. Variable. In this case, and this is dependent. In this case now, that we are going into regression. The interpretation is this, that The number of hours spent revising accounts or explains that 8% of the outcome is a score. And why? Why is the dependent of X? X is number of hours spent in revision. And Y is the score that one gets. So the score is depending on the hours. Hours is independent of score is depending on uh, the number of hours. So, the number of hours will explain I need to know whether we are together. I need to know whether we are together and like keep, keep going off. Yeah. Now we are back. Um, I agree we were, we were off, but now we are back. Let me know that whether we are, it's okay on your side. I'm almost concluding on this. Alright, let me know uh, whether we are together.
All right, and then I can go back, but miss the exponential meaning of that 8%. Allow me to go back to it. This is what we call Pearson R squared, which we get it from the Pearson correlation coefficient. You square it. If you square it, it's 0 0.62 times 0 0.62. 0 0.62 times 0 0.62, you get 0 0.38. Why is it important? I say that even when R is a negative value, if you are to multiply a negative value times a negative value, it will become a positive. And I say this, that R squared always is between 0 and 1. 0, no relationship. 1, perfect relationship. So as you head towards one R squared of one, you get perfect relationship. R squared of zero is no relationship. And therein you get weak relationship, moderate relationship, and strong relationship. Therefore, when you get R squared by multiplying the correlation coefficient, 0 0.62 times 0 0.62, you get R squared, which is 0 0.38, we call it coefficient of determination and coefficient of determination is very useful in regression analysis. Coefficient, correlation coefficient is useful in correlation because it only tells the direction and the strength. But coefficient of determination is used to predict and when you predict, you get 0 0.38 here is that 8%. What does it mean? It means that the hour spent in revising, which is independent, and score in the exam, which is dependent on the hours, that the hours spent in revising can only account or explain that 8% of the outcome, which is score. The other difference, which is 100 minus that 8, which is 62%, can only be explained by other factors, but not the time spent revising. So time spent revising has an impact into the outcome that is scored, but can only explain that 8% of the outcome. The balance, which is 62%, can only be explained by other factors, but not time spent revising. I hope it is correct. It is understood that. I hope, Edina, you are together up there. Let me know whether we are together or whether you have understood the data eight percent. Let me hear from you guys whether you've understood uh, the interpretation of the R squared, which is coefficient of determination. Is it clear? The rubo is it's understood and uh, other guys, is it clear up there? I'm almost finished with the video I'll do next time. Understood. Pinasara, Kelvian. Mudiani, Dennis, I need to know whether you understood the meaning or the significance or the interpretation of R squared, which is coefficient of determination, which is. I need guys to know whether you understood that. Let me know. So I guess it is clear the interpretation of uh, coefficient determination R squared uh, after you square your R correlation coefficient. Yes, it is. So what I will do, ladies and gentlemen, um,
have discussed the issues of uh, covariance and now correlation and I've decided to go deeper into correlation but I've also touched on regression however uh, five time probably uh, next week next week to go through linear regression and probably a bit of multiple regression however I have uh, perceived that there is a knowledge gap in as far as the issue of uh, determining degree of freedom determining um, the confidence level, setting a confidence level and also probability value, p-values and what we call random error, occurrence by random chance, random error in uh, research is concerned and because of that then, uh, that's an area of cover uh, before I go into uh, explaining whether to accept or to reject now hypothesis that you had set in this case so that one will take probably an hour, an hour and a half, which we do not have now. So you allow me to end the session here. The next session, uh, I'll begin with explaining the basis, the background on uh, DF, degree of freedoms, confidence level, setting those limits, p-values, so that I'll be able to explain whether to accept or reject the narrow hypothesis that we had set, that the hour spent revising is not positively related or correlated with um, with the scores, so that when you get that, um, then you see the importance of doing all that we have done, the calculations that we have done. Remember, I've said that most of the time um, you will feed data into the softwares, the programs like GraphPad, PC, and etc. And you click even the Excel. The Excel has got correlation. You highlight this data, then you you get an output. An output will be uh, you get a coefficient, correlation coefficient. You get coefficient determinations, but you need to know how they came about and how to interpret them. That is the essence of all this. So in the next lecture, two hours will be enough to go through that big background and also finish with the linear regression. But for now, so far so good. Now, uh, again, I don't know how you you you, you are take on uh, this YouTube way of uh, delivering lectures. Whether you want us to go this route or to go into the other one of, uh, of Google Meet. I need to be a lot. I'm finishing up, but I also remember to remember to uh, subscribe to this channel so that any other time we we are going uh, live you get prompted but for now it will be specifically for the lectures uh, i'm giving this series of lectures vivian jerry is saying that she thinks it's a, it's a great way of doing lectures this is better. Uh, uh, I get the difficulties to imagine how they have taken you through this on a, on a Zoom. So, um, um, I think the field is better and even easier to go back and listen to the lecture. Dennis, all right. Yes, you don't have to cram this. Eh? You need to understand the background, where they are coming from, so that when you get the computer outputs, uh, you not just apply things that you don't uh, comprehend. It will be important that you understand the basis. So what I do, um, I'm thinking this week, you know, no lecture this week until next week. Uh, we will agree whether you'll be on a day like today, the same time, or on Fridays. I'll leave that one to you to decide, to agree whether you want it to be on Wednesdays, the morning, 
our Fridays here to tell me. So next week we will cover what I have told you, the backgrounds of degrees of freedoms and all that, confidence level setting, p values, then we finish up with linear regression and probably a bit of multiple regression. Then uh, we will be on the right track. We have done, this is still part of descriptive statistics. We are almost coming to the end of descriptive statistics, but then we can go into inferential statistics. So, have a nice uh, week. Um, also, I uh, feel I've delivered quality uh, effectively today. Thank you. Good day.